I felt it was very important to stand up and counter a lot of the, the negative stereotyping that existed. And also to see myself represented, it's exactly what you, what you and your colleagues, uh, Donald, are doing in, in Shout Out. Today, as part of the Shouted interview series, we're speaking to Tony Walsh, who's involved with the Hirschfield Centre, GCN, the National LGBT Federation, and he's been a great advocate for HIV awareness and education. Thank you so much for joining us here today, all the way from Turkey. I believe you are now, yes? Yeah, delighted to be with you, Donald, and hello to everyone in uh, shout out. So, Tony, you've been involved for many years. So when you first came to Dublin, when you were a fresh-faced uh, 18, 19-year-old, how were you first involved in the movement? I became politically involved with the National LGBT Federation, it was then known as the National Gay Federation, and it had been responsible for, it was responsible for establishing and running the Hirschfeld Centre, which was a second attempt at an LGBT community centre in Dublin. It opened on St. Patrick's Day in 1979. I arrived in September of that year and spent, ended up spending all of my 20s uh, involved in one form or another in the administration of the Hirschfeld Centre and the running of the National Gay Federation, as it was then called. And what was it like to be involved when you were there in the Hirschfeld Centre? We some great clips of you there when you were younger. What was it like, the atmosphere, <laughs> the vibe of being in the, in the centre then? Yeah, I know there's a clip set floating around online somewhere of <laughs> me and some of my colleagues set, putting up a pink triangle, which was a sign, international sign of, of uh, lesbian gay liberation at the time. Well, you can imagine, like, to a 19-year-old, a 19-year-old who imagined he could change the world and wants to change the world. I mean, I was driven by a huge desire for um, social justice and political change. Um, insufferably so, I suppose, as an, an awful lot of 19-year-olds are. I mean, I found my tribe, I found my tribe in the Hirschfeld Centre um, and the National Gay Federation at the time. And it was, it was an extraordinarily exciting period because the, the LGBT civil rights movement was in its infancy. It was only five years old. So you can imagine at that time, there was, there was an extraordinary vitality and energy. And it was impossible for a 19 year old like me, it was impossible not to get caught up in that and wanting to sort of make my mark. And, and the other thing too is it's, I mean, it's hard to imagine a time when there were so few public faces there were so few public LGBT faces. So I think I, I felt a huge onus to actually stand up and be counted. And the, the success of LGBT liberation depended on having real, real life uh, people, people who were prepared to stand up and say, yes, I'm trans, I'm bi, I'm gay, I'm lesbian. So the LGBT civil rights movement and LGBT liberation itself, it needed people, it needed real life faces, it needed people to stand up and be counted, whether it was uh, uh, protesting, whether it was um, uh, marking pride, which we did from 1979 onwards in very small numbers, uh, whether it was being, uh, you know, um, finding representation in the print and broadcast media. Remember, this is at a time when the prevailing stereotype of the cultural social stereotype of a gay man was that we were uh, dirty pedophiles. We were child abusers. And that was the that was the mainstream lingering image that people had in their minds. Um, so it was very important. I felt it was very important to stand up and counter a lot of the, the negative stereotyping that existed. And also to see myself represented, it's exactly what you, what you and your colleagues, uh, Donald, are doing in, in Shout Out, is to ensure that we are represented, that we are visible and that we are represented in the conversations that are happening around how we change Irish society, how we better our world for ourselves and by extension for other people. You then became involved in the National LGBT Federation. What was your role then and what work were you focusing on when you were involved with them? Well, it's, it's indicative of how much the civil rights movement needed people, that uh, my, my trajectory as a civil rights activist was very quick. Uh, I started off as international secretary for the National Gay Federation at a time when we were running the information secretariat of the International Lesbian Gay Association. And it tells you, it tell, it tells you something too about how patched in Irish LGBT people were to wider global uh, political and cultural dynamics. 
that the National Gay Federation ran host of the information secretariat of this global organization for several years in the Hirschfeld Center before it moved to uh, Stockholm. So I worked as international secretary, part of an international political action group for a couple of years, then I was elected uh, general secretary of the organization, and then in 1984 succeeded Eamon Summers, who, who himself had actually succeeded David Norris as chair of the organization. And at that point, we had an elected membership actually uh, spread across the country. So we had postal ballots. Uh, it, in some cases, it was um, quite an unwieldy uh, organization. I mean, I remember chairing meetings where we had 18 people sitting around the table for like arguing the toss for four hours. It was like hard work at times, some of the administration. But it was really exciting. We not only volunteered our time to run a political organization that had several thousand members, but we also volunteered our time to run the community center. And the Hirschfeld Center, for anyone that doesn't know what it was, it was it it fulfilled several roles. It was a home from home for for dispossessed LGBT people, especially younger LGBT people. We had we established our first uh, LGBT youth group um, at a time when discussion in Irish society around uh, youth sexuality was quite fraught, and there was actually very little discussion around uh, queer youth uh, sexuality. In fact, uh, the, Nash, the NGF youth group was twice refused uh, associate membership of Cor de la Soiga, the youth service of the Dublin's VEC, and all of the National Youth Council of Ireland actually refused to recognise it at one point. Um, using the existence of the criminal law, the fact that male homosexuality was illegal, and there was just so much social opprobrium. Um, uh, existed in Ireland at the time. So we ran a youth group, uh, there was a women's group, uh, there was a media group, there was a cinema club, and then there was a dance club called Flickers, which is the Dutch word for faggots. Um, and Flickers was the cash cow that actually enabled all of um, this work to happen. The Hirschfeld Centre struggled to actually get statutory funding. When we set up GCN in 1987, we got a small amount of funding in 1989. That enabled us to actually, it was a, a work placement scheme, uh, which was essentially just 20, 25 euro top up, it was Punsen, but 25 euro top up to your dole, uh, and enabled us to actually part time employ people. But it's testament to the energy and commitment, political commitment, and the vision of thousands of LGBT men and women of various ages that they gave that of themselves selflessly to ensure that the Hirschfeld Centre would become a success. On my last question, you've been a tireless advocate as well for HIV awareness and education. Why, why is this? And you know, what do you think we still need to focus on when it comes to HIV awareness and education? John, I was very lucky, lucky enough uh, in some ways to uh, survive the AIDS pandemic. Um, that devastated a, an emerging LGBT community, managed to survive it, and I've managed, by the time I became HIV positive uh, 15 years ago, I was able to take advantage of uh, new, really, really good uh, antiretroviral therapies. Unlike many of my friends and lovers who died horrible deaths back in the 80s and 1990s. But you know, it's when I look at the, the, the landscape at the moment, around HIV advocacy, uh, around sexual health in Ireland, around sex, around sex education in Ireland, it seems that we're still having this, this uh, a circular conversation around, around many things. And lots of stuff hasn't changed at all. Um, I mean, we're talking about chemsex, for example, and the problems that chemsex has thrown up. And we, we talk about it as if it's some new um, millennial cultural and social phenomenon, chemsex, but actually just the language has changed, the drugs that people are using has changed, but the problems inherent in chemsex existed back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we're still talking about um, advancing a sex education culture that's fit for purpose in our schools, and I think that's not going to really happen in any great measure until we decouple uh, religion 
uh, and religious investment and religious ownership of schools. And we really have to sort of develop sec secular uh, education in this country if we're really going to... Uh, we're really going to be earnest about a proper sexual health uh, education strategy. Um, but we do, I mean, something that recently, like uh, It's a Sin, which just managed to um, uh, stir people's imagination and, and also uh, gave people a thirst for, for, um, for investigating and, and, and excavating the AIDS pandemic from the 80s and 90s. I mean, it's, I, I, I was really intrigued by people's response on social media platforms, uh, in the media, and just general conversations. Um, it seems to have caught something. Uh, it, caught, it caught people's imagination. That's possibly because, of course, we're living through another pandemic. But it, it also suggested that people are hungry for, hungry for information about what uh, our LGBT uh, forebearers were about. You know, Panty once made a very, made a very uh, observant uh, a statement at Dublin Pride one year in Marion Square, and she said, you know, it's, you'll, you'll never know where you're going unless you, uh, you, you'll never appreciate where you're going unless you know where you've come from. Uh, and it's, it's I, I do think we need to, we need to investigate our history a lot more. And we can do that in many ways. I mean, first of all, we can actually write LGBT history into uh, our school books. And that was something that the LGBTQI uh, youth strategy, which was launched by the government a few years ago, which is a great fan term, which you guys were, were um, a part contributor to. I mean, one of the recommendations of the LGBTI youth uh, strategy was that we quantify our LGBT history and we give it some value. And because it's not there, it's not there, you know, it's not in our history books. And I think we can extend that, uh, give, 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 um, give some strength to people's curiosity by also uh, designing cultural responses to our history. And what I mean by that is something like it's a sin. So it's a sin is a cultural response to the AIDS pandemic it's a, a, a piece of, of a cinematic a cultural response. And we need to actually have more of that. We need to have TV documentaries. We need to have film. Even we need to have people's amateur film. We need to have students, art students actually making stuff, interviewing their older LGBT um, acquaintances and asking them what it was like to grow up in Ireland in the 50s or 60s or something. Starting with the people who are very elderly and who are, don't have much more time left, asking them what it was like to live in an Ireland where an Ireland that made very little room for them. Um, you know, I think we can start there. We can actually start by um, making room for not only cinema and theatre, but memoir, uh, encouraging people of every age whether you're a teenager or, or somebody in your 50s or 60s or 70s, to start um, to keep a memoir, to start keeping a scrapbook. You know, because change is happening all around us. The future is now. You know, change is happening. What you're doing right now is you're going to look back on this in a couple of years' time and go, wow, that was a really exciting period. And it'd be re I think it would be really important to remember what you were doing, to remember how you got to the bloody um, COVID pandemic and the specific cultural and social needs, you know, that, that the specific cultural and social needs that LGBT people have, the minority groups have, because we do have specific needs. I think we're at a point now, post Maref, post-gender equality, post-gender recognition, post-decriminalization, all of those big important pieces of the civil rights um, jigsaw have been put in place. And I think now we're at a place and, and I want to urge everyone in, in um, shout out and, and all of your allies. I think we're now in a place where we have to ask ourselves, what's next? And what's next is actually documenting our lives, documenting our lives and making sure that we call out any lingering discrimination and bigotry, um, and homophobia, and transphobia that we witness, to call it out and to say that there is no place for it in, in, in a modern society. There's no place in, for it in the new republic that we're trying to build in Ireland. And there's no place for it in the world. I think that's going to be the next big thing. Culture, 
queer cultural heritage. I mean, I think the time is right. The time is right for queer cultural heritage. Um, more cinema, encouraging people to make films, encouraging people to make TV, encouraging people to use all the various platforms that are out there, channels on YouTube or whatever, to use various channels that are out there, print and broadcast media or whatever, to record their stories, to document their existence, and to actually use that to then challenge the heteronormativity that we uh, often uh, encounter in Irish society, in the world at large. Tony, thank you so much. I'm sure we could sit here for hours and hours and talk about so many things. And thank you so much for all you've done. You've raised some really interesting points there. And I think you're right, as you said, you know, if you do, we don't know where we're going, if we don't know where we come from. So thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, you're welcome, Don. Thanks for having me. Okay.